Rather than Chetan, good morning. Chetan is a back to back. This is a record in itself. It's super inspired. It's nine o'clock, by the way. Yeah. Today we have a nine o'clock. Okay, it's nine o'clock. Okay. So, Radhe Radhe, good morning, good evening, everyone. Very warm welcome to today's edition of Daily Wisdom from Bhagavad Gita. Uh, let me pull up my screen. Okay, I'll let our co-host make the announcement, what I'm supposed to do. So, who's the co-host today? Yeah, Fali Ji is the co-host. Yeah. Please go Ooh. ahead. Wow, Shefali, you're the co-host. That's yeah. news. Can you please announce so that I can get started? Yeah, yeah, sure. Radhe Radhe everyone, uh, good morning, good evening and welcome to the uh, daily wisdom from Bhagavad Gita session. Yeah, over to you Nitinji. Thank you Shafali ji. So very warm welcome everybody. Good morning, good evening. Let me share my screen. We'll get started by invoking the blessings of God and Guru. Let me share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Mahishwarha, Guru Sakshat, Para Brahma, Tasmay Shri Guru Venamaha Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanu Mardana Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Krishnam Vande Jagat Radhe Radhe, warm good morning, good evening to all of you. So welcome to today's edition. Today we are going to touch upon, today is going to be the concluding session of Karam Yoga, at least for this series. And we are going to look at it a little analytically today uh, and bring in, bring in the, the mathematics around it, right? Just to, just to be able to appreciate where it can lead us. So hopefully we'll have an engaging discussion around it. And then we have a, a presentation as well today on a beautiful Krishna Leela that I'm looking forward to. So that would be towards then. So we have a hard stop at 10 today. So we'll try to rush through the discussion today. I will decide it. We'll pick up a few hands, hands today to get it going. Karmanyavadhikaraste Maphaleshu Kadachana Ma Karma Palahe Turbu Ma Te Sangostva Karmani. Okay, we can take a few hands. Get it going for one last time on this particular series for this time around. Okay, do we have few hands? Radhe Radhe, yeah. Radhe Radhe Dinesh Ji, please go ahead. Radhe Radhe. Radhe, Radhe. Karman neva dikaraste ma phale sukadachana ma karma phale turbu ma te sangostra karmani. Radhe Radhe, thank you. Radhe Radhe Chetan Ji, please go ahead. Radhe Radhe Shafali Ji. Karmanyava dikaraste ma phale se kadachana ma karma phale he turbhu ma te sango sattva karmani. Very nice Chetan. Today history was in making. Shafali called Chetan Ji and Chetan Ji obliged by reciting a Bhagavad Gita shloka. Wonderful. Great. Let's take a couple of other hands and then we'll get started. Yeah. Radhe Radhe Samji, please go ahead. Radhe Radhe. Radhe Samji. Karmanyabhadikaraste 
मापलेशु कदाचनो माकर्म फल हे माते संगो सत्मणि राधे राधे इट्स माते संगो स्वकर्मणि नाइस ओके वी कैन टेक द रिमेनिंग टू हैंड्स साई राम जी राधे राधे साई राम जी राधे राधे कर्मण ये बाधिकारस्ते मा फलेशु कदाचन मा कर्म फल हे धुर्बुर माते संगो स्वकर्मणि very nice sai ram ji i like your new look last time we saw you it was a little different acha <laughs> nice no radhe 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 all right radhe last radhe nilam ji yeah please go ahead radhe 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 karmanne vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachan मा करम फल हेतु माते संगोस्व कर्मनी वेरी नाइस नीलम जी मा करम फल हेतु नॉट भा रेस्ट ऑल वाज परफेक्ट ग्रेट ओके सो लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड फॉर वन लास्ट टाइम ड्यूरिंग दिस सीरीज आई एम श्योर वी विल डू इट इन फ्यूचर एज वेल एंड पील सम मोर लेयर्स आई आई थिंक दिस इज द सेकंड second time we are doing the karam yoga series second or third time probably and uh, every time i do it there are so many new facets that come to the fore right even the presentations if people who have attended before you would have seen there so many new slides that keep coming up and it's not going to be any different when we do it for the third time i don't know when but we will have to do it and we will do it so let's get started lord krishna is telling arjun that you have a right to perform your prescribed duties but you are not entitled to the fruits of your actions never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of your activities nor be attached to in action and these are the four principles that we have been talking it at length okay let's quickly revise those do not do your duty but do not concern yourself with the results which is the neto principle fruits of your actions are not for your enjoyment even while working give up the pride of viewership and do not be attached to an action you know one of the tra- one of the things that um, or i should say a bit of a challenge that people experience is that they think it's too idealistic right yesterday when i spoke about a shloka trina dapi suni chen taro rupi sahishnu now okay i will become humbler than a braid of grass how is it possible the world is going to trample me and use me like a door mat it's not at all practical so let's see we have to understand this it is not a unit step function spirituality it's a journey so it's not like you one day you will wake up and you'll become a saint it doesn't work that way however it is the aspirational target that is where we need to be and a very a big journey or a long journey always starts with a small step so the key here is to understand what is the next immediate step i can take so that i can start making progress how can i develop the right kind of mindsets and start practicing it and not get disheartened that it is a long journey and i'll i'll tell you towards the end of this discussion today what we can take inspiration from it's a very simple story okay and it would you'll be able to relate to that story considering the long road ahead or the long journey that may it may apparently seem to be however it should not refrain us or discourage us from taking the next little step that which is well within our control let's try the next step and see how how much delta we can improve and then a little more and then a little more and then magic starts to unfold but if we get disheartened oh such a big state who is going to become a humbler than a blade of grass okay and it's not possible then nothing will happen right so anyways move on let's continue on the shloka so we'll talk about the mathematics and the arithmetic around it right as you can see two two pictures the pictures are saying a lot and this is what we are going to talk about so on the left hand side as you see somebody is doing puja we all do puja like this however in their mind a lot of thing is happening a lot of action is happening what is on the gas did we slim it down is it going to boil over did the milkman come is the maid come but at the same time we are continuing to recite what we are reciting and on the other hand we see somebody is working apparently very engrossed in work 
but at the back of the mind they have god okay now we can touch upon that aspect as how can you work and have god at the same time right? that is also an interesting concept how will you work if you have god all the time in your mind it is actually doable and possible we'll look at it through some examples and analogies to drive home the point so let's first understand the a bit of a numbers or or maths around that part so let's get started the both scenarios we look at so one aspect of it is then we are doing our pujas ritualistic stuff that we are doing and while our mind is somewhere else we are where our mind is that is what our scriptures tell us so it becomes a mechanical exercise it is essentially a multiplication with zero however many um chantings rituals mantras you keep on adding not going to take us anywhere something is better than nothing but it is not going to take you anywhere so just think of it logically we have we have had infinite lifetimes it's not our first birth although your mind would like you to believe it is my first birth no nothing like that we have had infinite lifetimes and in in every lifetime even if we have recited one one mantra or one time god names then we have already done it infinite times has it resulted in god realization no that means we are missing a point that point is our mind is not truly absorbed in god if you are thinking about the world and at the same time doing it just for the sake of completing that it is nothing but a multiplication with zero yes rupa ji the question yeah radhe radhe everyone radhe. actually my question is to ask like uh, what if uh, you said this two examples right like uh, one is doing puja and concentrating somewhere else and someone is working and their concentration is in the god instead if someone is uh, thinking of god or else i can say that uh, i don't know they are thinking or they are just uh, uh, reciting the god's name and doing all the um, things which are not acceptable by god so how does that uh, go can you give it so if you are reciting god's name like uh, and thinking things which are bad right lot of people businessmen yeah. do that you know mata rani ki kripa hai and then they will go ahead and start doing something else so obviously it's a sin what you do with your indriyas and bodies it doesn't count let me simply tell you the simple simple thumb rule or yardstick around it whatever you do from your body and your senses speech smell eyes it does not count okay that should help answer this question what you are doing with your mind that counts but still doing bad things and uh, bad things that means your mind uh, is having <clears throat> lots right you cannot have a mind at a very good thing and then doing some bad thing your mind is sanctioning those things then that then only you are doing it that answers your question that means your mind is plotting bad things it means you will get the result of your mind not of what you are doing or saying makes sense it's your mind that you get result for not what you do from your mouth or from your hands or from your body doesn't count that is all multiplication with zero for god only thing that matters is where your mind is that's all so if somebody is doing bad things of course they will get you know the result of that not what they are saying or doing we'll come back to the next question let's finish off this discussion first so on the other hand thank you, Radhe, Radhe. thank you you might be engrossed in work and your mind might be engrossed in god now this seems like a concept which doesn't make sense to a lot of people right how can you work and still have your mind in god even i had this question initially okay it it is actually possible how let's look at it through some examples now let's see um, when we operate right when we are operating in this world not for a moment do we lose sense of our identity do you forget that i am a girl or i am a boy no right a mother or a daughter they will even for a moment do they forget that she is a mother even though she might be doing so different things 10 different things during throughout the day no right 
So that sense of identity, which is so strongly ingrained in our DNA, we have to reach that stage where God is synonymous with our identity. He is there. It is possible to do that. It's not that you have to consciously think at that point. See, it's like driving. Initially, when you're driving, you have to think, okay, now that this thing has come, I have to change the gear. I'm not talking about auto gear cars, okay? The ones manual in India. And now the person will come, I have to brake, and now I have to take the steering. The slope is coming. I have to increase the gear. All that stuff you have to do consciously. But after a while, you are sipping a coffee, talking to somebody, listening to music, and the car automatically, your hand and feet are operating like that. That is also a state. So that is the state we have to reach. Also, another example Swamiji gives is when the cricketer, you know, you know that when the ball comes, it is hurled at 100 miles per hour. You know, some of the fastest ballers, they can go as fast as 100 miles, Shoaib Akhtar and all those people. So you have less than three seconds to respond to that. Even within that fraction of a second, a cricket, the, you know, the, the batsman, they take stock of the fielding field placements all around, you know, just before the delivery. And within that split second, they are able to bisect the field because they have made a mental map of where everybody is situated. So how could they play the shot if they did not have that knowledge at the back of their mind? Right? That means both existed simultaneously. So these are some of the examples to prove that both can exist simultaneously. God at the back of your mind and your focus on the work at hand. Both can happen. Arjun did the same in the battle. He did it for the pleasure of God. And not for a moment he had because the sophistication and the expertise that was required to carry out that battle was pretty high. He was fighting Drone, Bhishma, Karn and those kind, of, those kind of people. So it is possible. Now, how does this mathematics equate? Now, we said that if you are doing your pujas and your mind is somewhere else, thinking about everything, relations and all that stuff that is happening, it is multiplication with zero. When you're doing karam yoga, you're also doing multiplication with zero. But this multiplication is a good one. Let's see how. So in this case, you are multiplying your spiritual gain with zero. No matter how many zeros you keep on adding, there is no one in one before that. And in this case, you are multiplying your material binding actions with zero. Both cases, you're multiplying with zero. In one case, it is binding. Other case, it is non-binding. So, if you don't bring God into the equation, if you're not doing it for the pleasure of God, you're doing it for your own self, for your selfish interest, to gratify your senses, for your own enjoyment, then you are doing binding karma. In that case, it is not a multiplication with zero, but you are doing plus or minus. You are doing plus if you're doing satmic karma, good deeds, and you're doing minus if you're doing rajasik maybe neutral sometimes, or tamasic karma. Okay, So unless you are bringing God in every action, every thought, it is a binding karma. It's a very simple thing. Because you are, there are only two areas, God and world. And world is binding, even if you do it in sattva. So both cases, you are doing a multiplication. In one case, it is working to your advantage. And in the other case, it is working to your disadvantage. Simple. Okay. Now, this is the world. Here is your mind. And that's when you put it, you, you know, yoke your mind. We call yoking your mind. Like horses are yoked to the rein and the rein is yoked to the hand of the charioteer. Similarly, when you start yoking your mind to God, you are multiplying your karmas with zero. No binding karma whatsoever. Then it becomes a transcendental work. Transcendental work is worship. This is true worship. No other effort is worship. Okay. So this is a simple math around it. I hope it's making sense. Okay, I see some people joining even now. Let's quickly do a recap. So just to reiterate the point, if you are working, doing your pujas and rituals in the world, and your mind, um, you know, your mind is tied up with the worldly activities or worldly thoughts, it's a multiplication with zero. You are not getting any benefit. You might be thinking, I am doing Lakshmi Aarti, Saraswati Aarti, my regular puja, the Vedyam and all that stuff. But truly speaking, it is zero. Because if your mind is not there, it doesn't count for anything. Okay? And this is one thing where people get stuck. When I heard it for the first time, I was blown away with this concept. This is the kind of puja we are all used to doing at homes. 
two time puja everybody does not to suggest they don't have god in mind but for most part it becomes a ritual where your mind is somewhere else and then you don't get benefit for that at all on the other hand when you do your work with the consciousness of god at the back of your mind or the pleasure of god then it starts becoming a transcendental work guna teeth work shuddha sattva work and then you are multiplying it by zero what the binding karma that means you are not adding any more binding karma and getting a step closer to the surrender aspect of it as well karma yoga is a stepping stone towards surrender to god because we spoke right some of these spiritual concepts they are not unit step functions it is a journey and you have taken a giant stride forward on that journey if you start practicing some of these principles let's move on so this is the yoking of your mind if your you mind is yoked to the lotus feet of god multiplication with zero no more binding karma so the backpack that you came up in this world your soul came with in this world with that subtle body sanskar and all that baggage of previous karma you are not adding any more baggage to it at, at this point it is a simple multiplication with zero at that point that means what that means neutral you did not do any addition to your existing karma you have just not you have done neutral actions so that is why arjun committed so many murders even um, hanuman ji committed so many murders but was it counted as a murder in the court of god's law no because his consciousness was service to god at that point so that was not considered as a murder at all so this is the concept okay so both multiplications i hope this gets etched etched in your memory and you you can remember it always we have to multiply our karmas with zero not our spiritual practice with zero that means when we do our spiritual practice god has to be there to take full advantage so that me time with god whatever that time is it should be exclusively devoted to god it's just you and god at that time no third person at that moment right so we have the whole day to think about the world but when you sit in your ekant sadhana and even if you're sitting in a satsang that is also ekant sadhana if 50 people are sitting and everybody is thinking about god that is also sadhana ekant sadhana in a way but then at that moment we just need to exclusively think about god to really gain the benefit uh, from a spiritual standpoint if our mind goes all the way places we have to tame and get it back there so that is the key concept here so let's move on let's look at it from a hierarchy standpoint the worst thing is inaction in karma yoga we have spoken about this concept okay this is the worst thing one person can do inaction laziness making spirituality as an excuse to run away from responsibilities okay the next step for that is so if you look at it inaction is running away from prescribed duties and work better than that is sense gratification at least you are working now right you are doing something it's better than not doing anything but then you are attached to the result and you are doing the work for your own thing so your self aggrandizement so to say but that is better than inaction better than that is you start doing you become process oriented and detached to results and dedicate your results to a higher cause that that's better than this now you are working for a big picture how our god is still not in the equation okay because you are an atheist or whatever the case may be it can happen to you will find enough examples and the best is you are process oriented you are detached to fruits and offering fruits to god okay in the third step detachment to fruit is very difficult as well you might still be attached to some results even though you might be process oriented but the fourth one when you are meeting all the four criteria that is the that is the highest state and that is essentially what karam yoga is so if you look at it if i were to simplify this renounce what karam yoga renounce what what are you renouncing here action no you're not renouncing action sense of doership are you renouncing that yes ram ji said yes and the answer is yes attachment to resonance are you renouncing it yes fruits of action are you renouncing it yes 
offer to God, you do that and this becomes Karam Yoga. Okay. Simply put, this is what Karam Yoga is. All right. Now, let's look at it a little more. This is an ocean. Can you count how many drops of water are there in this ocean? Anybody can count that? All right. Can anybody count how many dust particles are there on this earth? If you cannot count it, uh, then to put it in perspective, this is how much Sanchit Karma we have. That is not good news, right? Of course it is not. This is what is the stockpile of our Sanchit Karma from across lifetimes. Okay. Now, out of this stockpile that we have, We can't. Now, prarab, do you know what is prarab? When we are born as humans, a drop is picked up from this ocean. God decides this drop, I will give them as part of their prarab in this life. He's not giving us the ocean. And that prarab is very, the way he picks up is basically he'll tailor. It's a custom made course for you in a particular life so that you can progress the kind of lessons you learned. Only he knows what prarab he's going to pick up. We cannot say, can you give me that prarab, this prarab, that I prefer? No. That prarab is given by God to us. Okay, now let's talk about Karam Yoga. How does it all tie together? Karam Yoga, I said, you will multiply it by zero. What does that mean? That means this drop, you would exhaust. Still, it's not very encouraging if you, if you are thinking analytically. How many lifetimes you of perfect karam yoga would you need to in, exhaust this ocean mathematically if you can't even count it how many lifetimes just to exhaust this ocean just think of it seems like mission impossible right and that too when you do perfect karam yoga in your per current lifetime you use the 3x formula 8 hours of work Dedicated to God, do your ekan sadhana, all that stuff, perfect thing you are doing in every lifetime. So you exhausted everything. How much is that everything one drop? How many lifetime would it take? It's kind of a mission impossible. Yeah, Sunday you wanted to add, you think you counted that? Okay, good. That is encouraging then. All right. So let me tell you a story then before you get disheartened. So here is a bird. Okay, bird has laid its eggs in this nest and what happens is it gets swept away by the ocean. Wind blows and the eggs are into the ocean. Now the bird comes, bird doesn't lose hope. The bird comes and starts, you know, taking one drop at a time from the ocean and putting it back. So the other birds come as well. They say, hey, what's going on? What are you trying to do? He said, I am going to drop by drop, going to exhaust the ocean so that I can get my eggs back. That is what the bird is saying. Okay. And the remaining birds, they also joined. They said, wow, how inspired this bird is. We should also help it out and pull our weight with it. They also start doing the same. And when they start doing the same, Garud Raj comes. He asks them, what's going on here? You know, heavy duty stuff that you guys are doing. And they tell, you know what? The ocean actually took all the eggs away and we are going to empty the ocean through our beaks to reclaim the eggs back. And when the Garud Dev hears that, he goes to the ocean and said, all right, about time you return it back all by yourself. He gets so touched by this effort of them. And what happens? The ocean has to Ocean has no option but to return the eggs back to the bird. Okay. Similarly, when we do Karam Yoga, it is a stepping stone towards surrender. When we start exhausting it drop by drop, or possibly exhaust the first drop, we don't know. God only knows because it will take us close to surrender, and possibly we can complete our surrender as well. Then Lord Krishna says. That when you perfect your surrender, Sarveshu, you know, basically Sarva Pape Bhyo, all the stockpile of your previous karma and your papas, I am going to burn it up for you. 
that's his promise he knows that mathematically we can continue to do this and that and you know how many lifetimes it will take us even if we perfect it not so as a part of his mercy is i am going to burn it up and that is his mercy so another reason for us to look at an opportunity to perfect our surrender through this practice of karam yoga because karam yoga is essentially you are you are doing surrender what is surrender here i am not going to think about the results i am going to focus on the controllables because you are actually saying i am going to align to god's will around it because he dispenses the fruit so outcome is in not in my hand you've already accepted the principle of surrender it is a it is a giant step towards surrender because you are you understand you are already practicing humility that my effort is only about what i can do and god is the one who per, who basically dispenses the results so you already taken a big step forward towards surrender in this case second you acknowledge that it is god who who is, who is the supreme enjoyer not you that is also part of the surrender right that will enable you to have prasad buddhi around whatever comes comes my way i'm going to accept it so that also takes you closer one step closer to surrender right and then in action part where you don't think of you know shying away or shunning away from responsibility at that point you still understand that in grand scheme of things you still have to pull your weight even though god is the energizer he is still give us the free will to exercise so that we can you know perform our duties and responsibilities to the best of our abilities and progress uh, towards you know taking a step closer to him so all these principles are nothing but a stepping stone towards surrender it is similar to trying to exhaust the ocean that these birds were trying to do and when they were trying to do that in the process what happened did they really have to do the complete that work drop by drop you know emptying the ocean they didn't have to divine grace intervened and that is essentially what happens in this path as well when you are sadhan bhakti you try trying to put in effort god starts taking steps as well and when his grace starts mixing you know wonderful things start happening magic can unfold at that point and anyway in bhagavad gita lord krishna is is promising that when you perfect your surrender i'm going to burn up your stock piles of all your sanchit karmas right it's a huge huge promise and a huge mercy from that standpoint okay so this is what i was trying to talk about today i think we still have time again just a quick recap if you joined late it's important that we practice i have just some summed up the karma yoga for you in this particular slide and then this aspect is very important the manasi bhakti part of it you know you could be doing everything in this world rituals and all that stuff it's okay to do something you know than doing nothing but if you are satisfied doing this alone this will not suffice you have to go beyond that okay so if you are chanting four rounds eight rounds 16 rounds it is fine it's it's fine something is better than nothing but if you don't have the remembrance along with it you're not really getting credit the remembrance is the one you know before all the zeros you are, that you are trying to add with regards to uh taking god's names and in karma yoga we are still doing a multiplication but this multiplication is good for you because you are not accruing any binding karmas right and then we spoke about the principle of yoking your mind to god or we can do the same we looked at some of the analogies and then finally when we do that uh statistically it is very difficult to exhaust this ocean but then through god's grace we do that so let's look at it through a graph as well here you have doership and you have non doership okay and here is you have result focus here you have effort focus so what happens when you have effort focus and sense of doership anybody what kind of a karma would that be anybody wants to take a shot at it when you have effort focus but you have a sense of doership so let me quickly do that sir so i just it could be any of these based on the consciousness you have you're still in the world right you have a sense of doership still in the world it could be in any of these categories so it will start tilting towards more towards uh, sattva when you have result focus but you still have a sense of doership maybe some shades of other as well but still you are in the world and when you get to the third quadrant it will be primarily sattva because now you are not having a sense of doership and you are result focused however when you bring in god to the mix which is the fourth quadrant 
that becomes shuddha sattva and that is essentially what karma yoga part of it is that we have been talking about this is something that will enable you to to basically uh, is a transcendental practice at that point and that is why this practice is very important okay now any questions so far before we move on to our presentation section i think we have a beautiful leela coming up but i think we have time for a bit of a discussion on what we have discussed and spoken about so far yes our esteemed co-host please you can announce yeah radhe radhe shri ramya ji please go ahead i Radhe Radhe everyone, uh, Nitin ji, I had one uh, question, and actually uh, this question came up while I was uh, progressing in third and fourth chapter and connecting it back to the uh, uh, this session. So if I am uh, doing my karma yoga in a let's say in a perfect way, somebody does their uh, karma yoga that. uh no, oh, focusing on the effort and uh, they know that they're not doing it they know the truth of action of a god then is it uh, same as bhakti yoga because in some chapters in swami ji's uh, uh, uh like explanation also there was a place where, uh, where uh, it was said that bhakti yoga is is uh, uh, like better than gyan and karma yoga but proper karma yoga is same as bhakti yoga so that let me a bit confused like uh, is proper karma yoga same as bhakti yoga or are there any differences between the karma yoga what we discussed and bhakti yoga okay yoga itself is bhakti first of all let's understand so regardless of whether you doing karma yoga gyan yoga or bhakti yoga the bhakti component has to be there now karm yoga is recommended for people whose minds are materially minded okay that because it is a practice you are doing offering it to god offering it to so you are making that devotional so it's kind of a training that you are doing to your mind right we will talk about karm sanyas and karm yoga difference between that as well now the proportion of bhakti will start increasing and there will come a stage where you are no longer obliged to go through the drills of your regular mundane karma at all so if you look at it it is a stepping stone for something higher karam yog is saying okay you will have to perform your duties you will continue have to operate in this world because you are not yet ready to you know just give up everything and become a proper sanyasi karam sanyasi for, for that matter so karam yog is giving you an option or basically a good platform to to bring that devotional aspect into your day to day work at that point the work which was secular now it has become devotional but it is a practice you will have to Right, you can, and then bhakti yoga is pure devotion. Only thing that you care for is, you know, serving God and Guru and nothing like. But in order to reach that stage, pure stage where you can immerse yourself only in devotion to God, you have to go through this trial. It's more like going through certain classes before you are ready for the higher thing. So yes, your proportion of bhakti when it keeps on, it will keep on increasing even in karma yoga when you start to practice it. But we are in a particular situation, right? even if you leave the world today you think you will be able to do justice or you are ready for you know devoting your entire life and time and thought to god only not yet right how many people reach the stage of swami ji where you get a call from god not everybody so we, that means we have to go through this university of karma yoga and then see where god takes us but you can perfect your devotion even in karma yoga it's not necessarily you have to go to the next stage or or that is a higher stage in fact it is a recommended path by krishna and bhagavad gita is saying karma yoga is recommended path for 99% people because we are materially conditioned people right we all have born in situation families where this thing we are getting exposure exposure to and getting started or picking up on where we left last time around but not something like okay i am fish out of water and all i want to do is leave you know turn away from this and seek god and guru only that stage will also come so karam yoga is a stepping stone to something that will take us more towards you know maybe the proportion of bhakti would increase as you go along in this path that is why it is a very recommended path and you can actually achieve god through karam yoga alone you don't have to go to any other stage or higher stage for that matter i hope i answered the question part of it at least yeah beautiful nitin ji uh another one is uh, rupa ji radhe radhe rupa ji please go ahead yeah radhe radhe everyone 
uh, actually nitin ji can i just see the previous uh, two slides uh? i wanted to see that uh, karam yoga one that graph you were talking about Sorry. uh yes sir this one not previous this one just for a minute i just wanted to actually have a screenshot of it i i when i was doing it was moved so quickly no worries okay yes yeah, so karam yoga thank you eligibility to everybody if you look at it all of us are action oriented in this world right we are materially conditioned and that is why god has given us a very simple formula you do what you are supposed to do you don't have to do anything drastic in your life right you continue doing what you are doing just make it devotional bring start bringing in the god consciousness that is why karam yoga is so important and it is recommended by lord krishna in one place he says it's better than karam sanyas because people will look at externals they will see this guy has renounced everything they will not know internally both are same even a karam yogi perfected karam yogi and a karam sanyasi internally both are same for karam sanyasi the externally he has renounced the world as well right he is not obliged to go through the regular worldly duties and stuff like that although both are internally the same and karam yoga is recommended because people look at what people are doing right so if you continue to carry on your duty whether you are a student mother teacher professional but bringing your consciousness to god that is a recommended path that will take us closer to the and bhakti yoga you are already mixed bhakti in it shri ramya ji so uh, what do you do pure bhakti or you want to do bhakti in your work itself choice is yours but what you are ready for of course god and guru only can guide you on that guru can guide you you cannot say i am ready for karam sanyas or i am going to do bhakti alone guru will guide you and he will he usually has a tailored made message for each person some people he may say you leave and just come and do the same for some he say you continue doing what you are doing for some he may say you know you have to study hard or continue to work for a little while more so guru would know where what stage of uh, spirituality you are in and he will guide you exactly what is needed for you at that point because we have to learn certain lessons through karma yoga uh, and without learning those we are not really ready uh, you know to progress in our devotion as well beautiful explanation nitin ji uh, radhe radhe sai ram ji please go ahead uh, radhe radhe Uh, actually my question is from yesterday i didn't get a chance to ask it this is regarding uh, politics in the workplace sure. um, so there there are some people whose you know mind and buddhi are quite dushed and they do a lot of politics but hum kya jo kare so kare aise chhod de ki do something about it because it may be detrimental to our sort of uh, you know a performance at work as well i mean i'm not saying be attached to the result or anything like that but kabhi kabhi lagta hai ki kuch karna chahiye hame bhi just cannot be passive but take god's yes. name and do the politics not yes, to, i got the question so um, we'll probably spend 2 minutes and then i'll hand it over to lakshmi ji so yeah, i have a spot talking to kripa ji with spiritual principles it is basically a uh, contextual and you have there are shades of gray in that and we have to deal with duality it's not black and white so when we say tolerant means to keep on tolerating everything right when we say become humble that means you just you know start being uh, humble i mean it's an internal thing of course but those things have to be looked at in context right and now if you look at the act of arjun was it people would say he was not tolerant you know he put, he did the right thing so in this case also i think um, these dilemmas we have to resolve looking at in context as long as our mind space is clear we are not doing it out of bitterness resentment doing for a greater cause standing up is usually a good thing that's what lord krishna was telling arjun as well right so yes these things it's not like a black and white tolerant means tolerate everything in life right? if you have to for a larger good you have to take a stance of course you will have to take a stance in those kind of cases so it becomes contextual at that point but the key here is not to have bitterness resentment or something which is hurting our antakaran you know i give that story of guru gobind singh uh, he was fighting a war and then when the other person was at his mercy just about when he was about to slay him this guy spit back at him 
And when he spit back at him, he stopped. He stopped. He didn't kill him. So the guy asked him, why didn't you kill him? He said, because previously I was doing it as a matter of duty. And when he spit back at him, all of, all of a sudden I had a rage of anger. Now, if I had killed him in this consciousness, I would have incurred a sin. So the, the internal thing is, external act could be saints perfected, but we have to get to that stage. So yes, we have to do the right thing, but our inner bhav, that intention has to be pure. Why am I doing it? Am I massaging my ego? Am I trying to prove a point? You know, to somebody, or am I doing it for the larger good where I don't have anything? You know, I, I so I think it becomes a bit contextual. I hope that answers part of your question. Yes, thank you very much, Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Okay, Lakshmi ji, all yours. Sorry, I hope you still have time. She wants to do a presentation today, so I'll hand it over to all. It's all yours. I hope you have been already set up as the co host. Do we have Lakshmi ji? Yeah. Can I share now or? Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead and share it. I hope we can, we'll get time. So you have, still have 15 minutes. Hopefully 10 minutes we can wrap up and then do the announcement. Is it okay now? Yes, we are able to see it. You're, you're able to see it, right? You may want to do a full screen or please go ahead. Yeah, one minute. Is it okay now? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. You have aced it. Yeah, Radhe Radhe everyone, and today I'm going to present Damodar Leela. Uh, so this is a, Damodar month is otherwise called as a Kartik month, the nearest month of Sri Krishna, and it is one of the holiest month of the year. Here, performing the devotional activities for the pleasure of God uh, blesses with uh, a thousand times more than any other month of the year. The actual meaning of Dhamudara is Dham is rope and Udaram is abdomen or the belly. So Mother Yashoda tied him with a rope for his mischievous act. And Dhamudara is also 367th name in Vishnu Sastrama. So churning yoga, uh, as, uh, as you know, as we all know, that uh, Sri Krishna goes to other, other gopis house and uh, he breaks the pot and eats the butter. Then Mother the Yashoda one day, it falls on the Deepavali day. She thinks, why can't I make uh, butter out of the yogurt for Sri Krishna with love and as affection so that he, he doesn't go to the other houses to do that. So she, start, she starts turning yogurt and uh, after some time, Sri Krishna approaches uh, Madhya Yashoda uh, desiring for the milk as he was hungry. And with the immense love, Madhya Yashoda embraces Sri Krishna and keeps him on her lap and starts the breastfeeding. So this is the sweetest moment of Mother Yashoda feeding Kaniya. And with the immense love, she'll be immersed watching his face with love. Then she suddenly remembers the milk kept on the stove was boiling and spilling out and get, getting burned. Now uh, Yashoda wants uh, the milk not to be burned because it is loved by Sri Krishna. Then she keeps aside Sri Krishna and goes into the kitchen to turn off the milk, turn off the stove. So in that time, then uh, Krishna gets very angry. And now uh, Krishna thinks, Mother Yashoda loves me or the milk. Why she has left me here and she went off. With that anger, he takes a stone and breaks the pots of butter. Little he eats it and he takes to distribute it to his friends. Now Yashoda Maya comes out of the kitchen and she sees all the uh, mischievous thing or bro broken pots and then she thinks this act is done by nothing other than my Kanaya itself. Then she decided to punish him and she takes a stick in her hand and starts and goes out in searching Sri Krishna. And she finds Sri Krishna standing on the motor, a uh, uh, wooden motor, uh, distributing the butter to his friends, the monkeys. Then Mother uh, Yashoda slowly enters the area so that he can caught Sri Krishna. But our Sri Krishna is very intelligent and he can sense the presence of her mother and he turns back and sees Mother Yashoda with a stick in anger. Now he jumps from that motor and runs away in fear. Now Mother Yashoda firmly decides to catch him, determines to chase him and catch him and punish him. And as a mother usually thinks to uh, reduce their mischievous things and make them in a discipline.
and grow them in a disciplined manner. Now Mother Yashoda starts chasing him, uh, but Kaniya is too small. He can run fast, not but Mother Yashoda. But still she determines with full efforts and energy to chase him and catch him. Now while doing so, uh, it takes a little time. And so the Mother Yashoda gets tired. Her hair becomes loosened and the flowers which have been decorated on her hair falls down. Then Krishna realizes that Mother Yashoda is getting tired. He looks back and sees her in uh, perspiration and tiredness on her face. Then he decides to pace, uh, slows down his pace and get caught. Then Mother Yashoda finally caught Sri Krishna and started telling or teaching him what to do and what not to do. But in fear, Krishna starts crying. So the picture shows very beautifully how he's crying and rubbing his uh, ears with the tiny lotus hands. And you can see the fear on the face of Sri Krishna when Mother Yashoda was uh, ready to punish him. So seeing this fear on Krishna's face, Mother Yashoda doesn't want to punish him, but only just make him to uh, realize the mischievous things and prevent him from other serious mischievous things. And uh, the second point, she doesn't want her Kanaya to run away from fear from her. Now she decides only to tie a rope onto her abdomen and tie that rope back to the motor so that he will be away from some time to her, uh, from, her from their friends and prevent him from doing all these mischievous things and not to run away from her. So with that thing, she decides to tie a rope and she asks her maid servants to get the rope uh, to her. When she gets the rope and starts tying around, uh, winding around the abdomen, at the end of winding around her Krishna's abdomen, she finds always two fingers width of short to put a knot and tie him. However, he makes many ropes to tie to the original rope to lengthen it. At the end of the act, he finds the again two fingers short. So she's getting tired and exhausted and her uh, face shows that she's tired, exhausted and perspirated. Then Kanya says, this is the end of her love or I mean, test to the mother Yashoda's uh, love towards him. And now he thinks, yes, I'll make mother Yashoda to tie those two short of knots and make her intention of re uh, realizing uh, him that he should not do the mischievous thing. So unless the, so this shows that, uh, uh, that uh, Sri Krishna comes down to the devotees when the devotee shows immense love towards him. Finally, Yashoda ties him to the motor board with the rope around the abdomen. It says that seven rounds around the abdomen, four rounds around his feet, two rounds around the hands and two rounds around the neck. Then she, uh, says Kanya to be there and not to do any mischievous things. And she just leaves that place to attend her house, household affairs. Okay. And so Sri Krishna, uh, during that time, now Sri Krishna wants to move from that place as, as his want to do all that mischievous things. Down he pulls the motor towards uh, forward while he's walking, but it gets struck between the two long old trees which are nothing but the uh, Yamala Arjuna trees, which are, which were nothing but the son, uh, two sons of Kubera, which who were cursed by Narad Muni and becomes uh, uh, trees. Now, uh, once the pull of uh, Sri Krishna uh, uproots these two uh, uh, trees, and those two will appear, who are nothing but Nalavura and Manigriva, sons of Kubera. And they shows their obsciences to Sri Krishna and gets permitted to get departed. That's how it gets relief from their curse. So my question is, the Leela depicts two fingers short, even though Mother Yashoda was with immense love, what does she does any work with love towards Sri, Sri Krishna? It is said that there are two points in this. First point is, devotees endure the Parishrama. You should make best of your efforts, no matter how many attempts you need to do, you have to do it. But finally, the second point is success comes only when God graces us. That is Sri Krishna's Kripa. So for every act that is karma, as Nitinji said, these two are very important to complete our work and be success in Krishna consciousness. So 
I, I thought this to present because this is Dhamodara month or Kartik month, which starts from October 9th to November 8th. And the only thing we have to please God is to, in the evening, lamp a ghee lamp, preferably not oil, and recite Dhamodara uh, Ashtakam, which has eight stanzas. So the first stanza says in this way, oh, Nama Mishwaram Sati Dhananda Rupam Lasat Kundalam Gokule Brajamanam Yashoda Biyodu Glala Tavamanam Param Rushtamatyanta Dotrutya Gopyam This depicts whole Leela and the remaining six says all other, other steps in this Damodar Leela. And the final stanza is Namastu ste damne spura deepi damne vadi yodaraya da vishwasya damne namo radhikaya tvadiya priyaye namo nantalilaya devaya shubhyam. So this, this says that, O oh Lord Dhamodara, I first of all offer my obsolences to the ability of brilliant religion, which to the rope which binds to your belly. I then offer my obsolescences to your belly, which is the abode of the entire universe. I humbly bow down to your most beloved Srimati Radha Rani and offer all my obsolescences to you, the Supreme Lord who displays unlimited pastimes. So thank you, Radhe Radhe, and giving me this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Lakshmi ji, outstanding presentation. Um, and I'm so glad you took the initiative all by yourself. Like Lakshmi ji said, I want to present it. And I said, this is wonderful. And you know what? You can do Bhagavatam Leelas and keep on, you know, siphoning out all the beautiful Leelas. And it's amazing. And I've, I've seen your story, you know, over the last one and year now, how much inspiration you are giving. It's pretty amazing. And see, the pull of your story was so much that the Ras group, you know, all the way from Banara. Ras means Rahul, Ashutosh, and Sam, as you can see. Oh, they thank you, thank you. Banara see that <laughs> so they got pulled in as well but beautiful, beautiful nice narration uh rakshmi ji and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it i can see a lot of hearts pouring in and radhe radhe hope you're enjoying the divine bliss at swami ji's yeah radhe radhe nice nice radhe 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 we are, we are having a wonderful time here we can and it's the first time i saw you sarat instead of t-shirt Looking nice. Oh, okay, okay. I think I should wear it more often then. Maybe I should go to office more often then. So. Yeah, your force faces shows that uh, that uh, enjoyment you're having there. Yes, yes, yes. You can see and that. And presentation is awesome. Yeah, Lakshmi wonderful. Ji. Yeah, Lakshmi Ji. Presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Luckily, we joined in time. Our presentation nothing, only when it started. That's cross grade. That's it. Which I made it into a presentation. Great. Thank you. So participation from Manara as well. Guys, keep enjoying it and Bring in yeah, some yeah. nice nuggets when you get back to sessions. Okay, look forward to your presentation. Not just <laughs> but the Krishna Leela ones as well. Okay. She will die. <laughs> Great. So thank you. I know we are running short of time. Two more minutes. Sure, sure. Um, thank you so much. Oh, Aswina and team are there as well. I should. We should yeah. put some spotlight. We have like add spotlight. Here you go. See, we have so much of participation, <laughs> you guys. Where are you guys joining in from? You're are from? You? Where are you joining us from? All of you. Oh, my birthday today. <laughs> birthday. Happy birthday, Mavin. Okay. Very happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you guys. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to we see you. We have a lot of remote participations. I, I would love to see you guys and meet, meet at Temple when you get a chance to meet next time in person. Okay. And very happy birthday, Mavin. Thank you. From all of us. Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe everyone. Thank you. We have a hard stop in another minute. So thank you again. And we have a Diwali celebration, 11,000, 1111 diyas. Um, any other uh, quick announcement, Shefali, all over to you. Otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, we have a book club coming up, so you can stay back for that. And any announcement, Shefali, we have one minute. You can do that, and then we can wrap up our session for the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Lakshmi ji. Pleasure. See you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Shafali. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I just take over. Like, I'll just quickly add that we have Sunday satsang on Sunday, so please do not miss on that. 
and Rahul ji and team, the Ras team have joined us from the Banara uh, Shivir, which is also online Shivir available for all of us to attend free of course. So please avail the uh, opportunity. All the links are posted in the chat. So check that out announcements and attend the next session as well Radhe Radhe and it was so wonderful to see so many groups attending us today I took a screenshot so we'll have Very this nice. <laughs> let's post that yeah Sweena, Mabin, happy birthday and do attend Swamiji's lectures amazing lectures They're going on in retreat great thank you again everybody have a wonderful weekend stay blessed and I look forward to seeing you next week we'll continue on this fascinating journey so Radhe Radhe from my side Radhe Radhe everybody so Radhe have Radhe thank you I, over to you, Ajay Ji. I'll just stop recording. Thank you so much.